Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, part four of the $2,000 Cadillac build featuring the i7 8700K and a GTX 1080 Ti. This is part three of the Y vlog, graphics card, case, and power supply choice. Yes, there's a bunch on the desk. We're gonna go through these and more, including the case and power supply choice in this video. Linked down in the video description below will be the full playlist on this build, the previous Y vlogs, the parts overview. Coming up next will be the build video, overclocking, performance, and more. In the two previous Y vlogs, there was a lot of conversation about storage and RAM and CPU and motherboards and coolers and lots of different choices. What you see here on the desk is the illusion of choice because there really isn't any choice, not for a $2,000 build. If you've got $2,000 to spend on a gaming computer, the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti is really honestly the only practical choice. Yes, you could make an argument for a 1070 or 1080 or maybe an RX Vega, but the reality is if gaming is the primary use of your computer at this budget, it's 1080 Ti or bust. When I do the i5-8600K build, that's going to be where we're going to get into more discussion about 1070, 1070 Ti, 1080, uh, RX 580, GTX 1060, or perhaps RX Vega, depending upon where the aftermarket cards are at that point. But that's not going to be a $2,000 machine. That's more of a compromise build to find something for a more reasonable budget. At this price point, i7-8700K and 1080 Ti. First, I just want to briefly mention why the RX 580 and the GTX 1060 make no sense in a build with this CPU. These are good two to three hundred dollar cards, depending upon how much VRAM are in them. They're excellent 1080p, 60 frame per second, high detail AAA gaming cards, and even 1440p gaming at medium to high detail in some AAA games and in esports titles. But the reality is the CPU here costs more than these graphics cards do. If you're building a gaming computer, buying a CPU that costs more then your graphics card simply makes no sense whatsoever. These are appropriate for a Ryzen 5 1600 or perhaps an i5-8400. I would not even put these in an i5-8600K, 1070 or Vega 56 is the least I'd go into that. But for a mid-range $1,000 system, these make a lot of sense. In a $2,000 build, frankly, they shouldn't be part of the conversation. I am including them only because I get asked about them. And so I simply want to mention these do not belong with a $400 CPU. Now I'm briefly going to talk about the GTX 1070, 1070, and 1080 non-TI cards. The 1070 is $400, the 1070 Ti is $450, and the 1080 is $500. Roughly, at least that's where they're starting in December of 2017. Now these cards at least are in the conversation. They have much more performance than an RX 580 or GTX 1060. But even still, if you're spending $150 to $200 on your motherboard, up to $400 for your CPU, $100 plus on the cooling solution for that CPU, plus all the other items that go with your machine, the price difference between these cards and a GTX 1080 Ti is not so much as to make them really make sense. If you want to save some money in this computer, there's other places I'd do it besides my graphics card. I covered the 1070 Ti and I've gotten a lot of questions about it. In fact, even recently people have been saying, well, it's a good in-between choice. It's a Ti like the 1080, so it's a good jump up, right? No, a 1080 is faster than the 1070 Ti is. It's an extremely narrow in-between card. If the prices of these drop to 400, it'll become more interesting. But as it stands, you're pretty much getting the performance for the dollar as you step up. In fact, the 1070 Ti at the moment is actually worse per frame per second for the dollars you're spending than the 1070 and 1080 are. So I would get one of those unless you can find one of these for less. Finally, the 1080. I know there's gonna be people who say, but I'm only gonna play at 1080p. Oh, but I don't really care about 144 frames per second. It's fine, right? Yes, it's fine. You certainly can do it. You can do anything you want. Custom PCs are custom. But if you're spending the kind of money we're talking about, your motherboard, your cooler, and your CPU will be more expensive than this. Save money there before you cut your graphics card. If you want a premium system, I'm not kidding. It really is the 1080 Ti or bust. Finally, somebody may say, what about Vega 56 or Vega 64? How about that wonderful Vega 64 liquid cooled that I covered? Well, Here's the problem. The Vega 64 liquid cooled is roughly the performance of the GTX 1080 with the price tag of the 1080 Ti. It's a nice card. If you're doing non-gaming tasks, there's a market for it. There certainly is a place for the Vega cards. But for gaming, 
The, the NVIDIA cards use less power, make less heat, make less noise, and are faster at any given price point. So frankly, at least in December of 2017, skip the Vega for gaming and just buy a 1080 Ti. Having settled on a GTX 1080 Ti for our $2,000 Cadillac build, which one should you buy? Well, the truth of the matter is, whichever one you want. The differences between these various cards are pretty minor. I've done a video titled, Which 1080 Ti Should You Buy? But the truth of the matter is, it's very personal preference. Do you like the red look? Do you want a white and black card? Do you like the uh, RGB colors of the ASUS card, for example? Is Gigabyte your favorite brand? It's very much a personal decision. Now, there are some minor differences in terms of size. For example, the For the Win 3 card has three very large fans. It is a two-slot card, but it's also tall. You might pick out a smaller case that doesn't have as much room for it, and that is where the SuperClock 2 comes in handy. Each of the companies does make different size cards for different applications. This is a shorter card in both length and height, and it makes it easier to fit into smaller cases. It's about 50 megahertz slower out of the box than the For the Win 3 and maybe two or three degrees warmer than the For the Win 3. Those are very minor differences. You can overclock both of them. Yeah, the For the Win 3 is nice and maybe a little bit cooler, but if you don't have room for it, don't feel bad about buying a SuperClock 2. It is a very nice card, but that's true of all of these. Buy the one from the brand and the look that you like. Beyond that, buy based on price. The next choice in your system build is your power supply. Now there are like a million different power supplies on the market and I completely understand how it can be confusing. Let me simplify it for you. For a $2,000 build, I would buy nothing less than an 80 plus gold rated power supply. Yes, 80 plus bronzes would work, but I think at this level, spending a few extra dollars on an 80 plus gold makes sense. You get better power efficiency, you often get better warranty and better internal components in the power supply. Is it worth going above the 80 plus gold? What about 80 plus platinum or titanium? As a general rule, no. I don't think those are a great value for the money. You can, and if you live somewhere where power is really expensive and you use your computer all the time, they might pay for themselves over time. They are more efficient. For every 100 watts that your computer needs internally, every power supply will overdraw from the wall. An 80 plus gold might pull 110 watts, whereas an 80 plus titanium or a, tit or a platinum might only pull 106 to 108 watts of power. We're talking about a couple of watts per 100 watt difference. Now to be true, if you're pulling 500 watts total power, yeah, that still isn't even that much power. Replace one of the light bulbs in your house with an LED and you're saving more power than frankly the difference between 80 plus gold, platinum, and titanium. Once you've picked out the efficiency rating of your power supply, now the question is how much power do you need? 500 watts? 700 watts? 1000 watts? Well, the truth of the matter is modern CPUs and graphics cards are very power efficient. In normal gaming tasks, I do have a power meter hooked up to my test bench i7 8700K overclocked to 5 gigahertz fixed on all the cores, a high-end factory overclock 1080 Ti, pulls about 350 watts from the wall. Yes, that's it. Internally, it's using closer to 300 to 320 watts because that's the wall draw power, not taking into account the power uh, unit's efficiency loss. Now, that's not A to 64. When you do extreme stress testing, a Prime 95 test, yeah, you'll get up to about 400 watts or so. Would I put a 450 watt power supply on a 2000 R computer? No, I don't think you need to cut it that close to the margin. You could, and it would work, but yeah, buy a little bit more. But you don't need a 1000 watt power supply to run a computer like this. Not even for two 1080 Ti's and SLI. 850 would be plenty for that. The reality is a 600 to 700 watt power supply is absolutely all that you need. And if you're running at 350 on the, draw, on the wall draw, a 700 watt power supply puts you right at 50% usage. 50% usage is the most efficient uh, point that the power supplies can be at. That 80 plus gold rating only applies in about the middle, maybe 20 to 80% band usage. Very high end and very low end draws on power supplies are much less efficient than drawing in the middle. So the 750 watt power supply that we're putting in is plenty for this computer. Frankly, it would drive two 1080 Ti's and SLI even though I don't recommend it. That leads us to brand selection. Do you buy a Cooler Master, a Be Quiet, a Corsair, a Seasonic, or an EVGA? 
The reality is these are all excellent power supplies and I recommend all of these without reservation. I've used all of these. This power supply is in my existing 8700K downstairs. The 850 watt version of this is in my Ryzen 7 that I've been using for six months. I've used multiple EVGA uh, power supplies in videos and the Seasonic power supply is actually on my test bench back there which also has an 8700K overclocked. And of course the Corsair RMX power supply is installed in my Skylake X system which is currently under the desk. So I use these in all of my systems and recommend them all. Now that may not help you make a decision. You may be saying, well, great, but which one should I buy? Well, part of that comes down to brand preference. Some of that comes down to price. All of these are on sale at some point. There's mail-in rebates and deals. That is what the links down in the video description are for. Check out current pricing. You may find a deal. One or uh, more of these may actually be on sale and might be the deal to buy. Now, there are other some minor differences between these. For example, warranty lengths are different. Some have five years, some have 10 years. Some have flat black cables, some are fully modular, some are semi-modular. There are so many different units you can consider. Just as an example, if you take a look at the EVGA, for example, you've got the GQ, the G1, the G2, and the G3 lines. Yes, no kidding. They make four different um, 80 plus gold power supplies with varying levels of modularity and the removable cables and the warranty lengths are different. And the power supplies are actually made by different companies. Very few of these companies actually make power supplies. Seasonic does. But actually, frankly, EVGA, as much as I love them, doesn't make power supplies. They use Superflower, Seasonic, and some other brands when they make them. Same thing with Corsair, same thing with Cooler Master. That doesn't make them bad, they're just, they're just different. So when you take a look at your power supply choices, buy based upon features, fully modular versus semi-modular, buy based upon brand preference, uh, warranty length, if that's a concern of yours, and whether or not they have flat black cables versus sleeved cables. Some people prefer the, prefer the flat cable, some people prefer sleeved. And then really it just comes down to what you prefer and what you want to pay for. That may or may not answer a lot of your questions, but there are literally hundreds of 80 plus gold power supplies on the market. Trying to go through them all, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. If you want the easy version, these are linked down below. I've personally used them. They work great. I've had no problems with them whatsoever on highly overclocked top end systems. Finally, that brings us to case choice. Now, I am not going to stick 27 cases on the desk and talk about all their features. Frankly, that could be three whole sets of videos. Instead, I'm mostly gonna talk about this case and then just provide a few other examples. This is the Cooler Master Master Case Pro 6 that we're building this computer in, and it is a very nice case. Now, before we talk about this case specifically, I'd like to talk about last year's build, the i7-7700K. Now, that was a $1,500 build. This is a $2,000 build. I cut a few corners in there that I wouldn't have repeated if I had the whole process to do over again, and one of those was the case choice. I used the Master Box 5 from Cooler Master rather than the Master Case. What's the difference? They're both mid towers. They're about the same, right? I assure you they are not. The cooler installation options, the modular configuration options, just the quality of the metal and the attachment of the front, back, and side uh, panels is much nicer on the master case. Now it is uh, more expensive. It retails for about twice as much as the MasterBox 5, but it does offer more features and it does provide better cooling, more fans, more fan mounts, and so on. One of the biggest regrets I had with my 7700K build was I put it into a case that really is more suited for, say, an i5 or a Ryzen 5 build, and I will be using the newest version of the MasterBox for an upcoming i5 build. But for an i7 or a Ryzen 7, get the Master Case line rather than the Master Box line. I have now laid the case on its side because I want to show you how nice and easy this top panel comes off. It is simply held on by the four magnets which are attached to the top of the case. So you can access with this panel right here all of these ports when this top cover is on. And what's really helpful is that the panel will actually lift up partially and stay in an elevated position for airflow purposes. I will be using that when I'm gaming, but when I'm not, you can collapse it down for a sleeker look. I'm starting with the top of the case to explain part of why the master case is a better choice for this. This will take either a pair of 120 or 140 millimeter fans or a 240 millimeter liquid cooler. 
Please note that there's really not enough room up here for a 280 millimeter liquid cooler. If you want a 280, you want to go with a larger, maybe full tower case. It just, there's not enough length in this mounting bracket up here. I know, I tried. Before I filmed this, I tried to see what would fit in there and it really doesn't. So 240 millimeter liquid cooler or a pair of 120 or 140 fans fit up here very nicely. What is great is these screws right here. You don't have to try to mess around with mounting stuff inside the case. This entire tray simply comes off the top, allowing you to mount your radiator or fans to it and then simply insert it back onto the case. This is a very nice mounting system. I do wish it held a 280. It doesn't, but considering what it is, it actually is very, very well designed. The other reason I'm starting up here is this is here. I am not going to put the Master Maker 8 into this case after all. I measured it, I looked at the size inside of it, I looked at the motherboard and the clearance with the RAM slots and ultimately decided I could do it for testing purposes and demonstrate the build. The ultimate problem is I'd end up taking it back out. I need all four RAM slots available to put 32 gigs of RAM in here because this is gonna be my new live streaming machine for Twitch. Twitch is linked down in the video description below. If you'd like to follow me and watch my live streams, please go check it out. But the reality is the Master Maker Air 8, as nice as it is, doesn't fit well enough with the motherboard and the RAM slots, and so I'd end up replacing it with a liquid cooler, which is why I've already checked to see what would fit. Now, this is the Cooler Master Master Liquid 240. It is not the light version of this cooler. It is not that much more expensive than the light version, and for an i7 8700K, get the non-light version. The hoses are nicer, the pump is nicer, the whole thing is just a bit nicer. The fans are actually the same that go onto the radiator between the two. I did look and they're the same model number, but for only a few dollars more for something like this, I would definitely recommend the Master Liquid 240 over the 240 light. For a small price difference, get the nicer cooler. Another plus to this is it gives me a chance to test a 240 millimeter cooler on the i7-8700K at five gigahertz. I know for a fact that it runs fine on a 280. I know it runs fine on the big tower cooler, so I don't have to test it because I've already done both of those. This will be the first time I'm doing it. And so when I do the overclocking video, we'll see how well it runs in terms of temperature, fan speed, and noise on a 240 millimeter liquid cooler. Coming forward to the front of the case, you can see here the power switch, the uh, headphone and microphone jack, and then the USB ports. This is normally covered up. When that top cover is on here, you can't see them, but it's got that flap that you can open up. It folds all the way around so you can access it, press the buttons, plug things in, or leave it closed for a nice clean look. Here we are back to the side of the case. It's got a lot of options for expansion and something that a lot of cases don't have these days. Five and a quarter inch drive bays. There are two of them and you don't have to mess around with screws if you want to mount stuff. See these sliders right here? All you do is slide them there to lock your drive in place, slide it back. It really couldn't be any easier. Now with a big panel on the front, you might say, well, how are you going to get to the drives? As I said, it's magnetic. They just pop right off and pop right back on. I have put the top cover and the front cover back on. If you need lots of ventilation, the front intake fans, the exhaust fans on the top for the liquid cooler while you're gaming, these will pop open like this and there's airflow all the way around the cover. Now you can completely take it off and then you've got all the airflow in the world. But when you're just in windows and the computer's not very stressed, you can also push these in just like that for a cleaner look. Same thing with the top, it pushes down. Now I don't have the side of the, uh, the side panel on, but normally it fits flush here with the side panel and then you have a very nice clean look. Again, if you put a five and a quarter inch drive in, these simply pop right off just like that with the four magnets, making it very easy. You can see in the front here, we have three, three and a half inch hard drive bays, but they also have the mounting screws inside each tray for an SSD as well. This entire tray is completely removable with two screws if you wanna put extended graphics cards in. I have measured and tested. The MSI 1080 Ti Duke and the 1080 Ti Gaming X Trio will not fit in here without removing this drive cage. The 1080 Ti Gaming X will, the two fan Gaming X, it is just short enough to fit. So it's important to note that extended length triple fan cards won't fit in here without removing this drive cage, but the dual fan cards will. There are two more three and a half inch drive bays down here also, which have the screw mounts for two and a half inch SSDs if you want to put those in. But just as important, mounted right here are two uh, flat surface mounting points for two and a half inch SSDs. 
Now I'm actually putting in more SSDs into this build than you saw in the first parts overview. That was one Samsung 960 Evo and one Samsung 9, uh, 850 Evo, but I'm actually putting in three more SSDs because live streaming recording, it's also my wife's computer. And so I'm gonna put two SSDs down here I'm gonna put two SSDs on the mounting plate here, and you'll see during the build video, I'm actually gonna remove this drive tray, not because I need the space for the Gaming X, which I'm putting into this machine, but because it gives more airflow. It is partially blocking one of the two 140 millimeter fans in the front. So if you don't need it, take it out to get better airflow and cooling for the system. I have now turned the computer around. You can see on the back, you can see there's plenty of pass through here for access to the back of the motherboard. You can see that there are plenty of grommets here. And what you can't see is there's actually pass throughs down here. You can see my fingers sticking through. That's for cables access in the SSDs and easy access for the front panel cables to run behind to the bottom of the motherboard, things like your USB ports, power, etc. The cable management in this is very, very nice. In fact, if you look here, you'll see Velcro straps and you'll see most of those cables running in a channel. There's room here to put more cables in this channel. You'll see that when we do the full step-by-step -step build. Here you can see the back of the case. The power supply actually mounts from the back. You undo those screws and pull the tray out. You actually connect it and then slide the power supply in. So a fully modular power supply is handy for installing it, but there's plenty of room down here to access the cables. And there are a couple of grommets coming up here to run all your cables through or through the back. Please note that I did check something else with this and I'm very pleased to say that the 140 millimeter fan that comes pre-mounted in the back will not obstruct any of the motherboards. And the reason is they gave the case some additional depth. This fan is actually offset back from where the motherboard actually mounts. There's a lip here to provide some distance between the fan and the motherboard. So if you have a motherboard with a large IO shield or plastic running around your IO shield area, you got a large VRM heatsink there. Um, this fan is actually recessed further back from where the lip of the motherboard is. It's actually really, really nice. Some of the troubles I've had recently with some of the mid-range cases and installs that I've done have centered around getting the fan here to fit with getting a motherboard in. That is not going to be a problem in this case. No pun intended. And finally, I thought I would turn the case and face the camera. If you want to take the front panel off while you're gaming to get maximum airflow, you want nothing covering it to get maximum cooling, then this is what the front of the computer is going to look like. It's actually pretty fine, except of course for the uh, magnets here, which hold the front cover on. I will test it both ways. This is going to be my new live streaming machine. I'll be doing live benchmarks over on Twitch when I've got this up and running. I'll have the MSI Afterburner uh, on-screen display up. We'll be running Fraps. We'll be doing some benchmark testing while I'm streaming with you. I'll put the front cover on. We'll watch the temperatures and the fan speeds. I'll take the cover off and then we'll see what difference it makes. And we'll talk about that live in real time. Yet another reason to follow me on Twitch down in the description below. Now, just to sum up, having actually spent some time looking over this, measuring it, checking the fit and finish of the coolers, I do like this case. I really, really do. Now, I haven't built it yet. Of course, I'll give you more feedback when I do the build video. That's coming up next. But I will say that I've built in several cases lately that I wasn't jumping up and down about. The giveaway build video, for example, with the Corsair uh, Carbide 400R was challenging to say the least. Those problems aren't going to be here. This isn't going to be a problem to fit the liquid cooler on the top. It's not going to be a problem with the back with the fan here because it's actually pushed back from where the IO shield is. That is a nice touch. This is definitely a modern up-to-date case. I'm going to enjoy using and having this as my new streaming PC. Now, there are plenty of other nice cases that you can build with. I know there are fans out there of Corsair, NZXT, many other brands, more than I could possibly list. Cases are a highly personal choice. You may not like this case. You might want something bigger or smaller or a different color or that's fine. Custom PCs are custom. You can build in anything you want. Let me offer you this one piece of advice. If you're building a $2,000 machine with an i7 8700K and a GTX 1080 Ti, don't buy a $50 case. Don't buy a $70 case. Don't do what I did with my i7 7700K. The Masterbox 5 was a mistake for that. There was not enough cooling. There were not enough fan mounts. There were no mounts at all on the top whatsoever. I had to go with a smaller liquid cooler on the back. This is a much, much better choice. 
It doesn't have to be Cooler Master. I like it, but it doesn't have to be. But pick something in the 100 to maybe 120, $130 range. For a $2,000 build, you're looking at five to 7% of the purchase price of the total machine. You're gonna get years and years. You may very well go through two, possibly three upgrades during the life of your case. You can keep this through several builds, spend a bit more, get a premium case, whichever brand, whatever you buy. This is a place to put a few extra dollars in because you can keep this for so many years to come. That concludes part three of the Y vlog, part four of the Cadillac build video series. Everything is linked down in the video description below. All the parts I've talked about, this new cooler, the previous videos I've done, the upcoming build video will be in the full playlist linked down below. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. And as always, I will see you in the next video.